Good evening, everybody. I'm Paul Robinson. I'm a professor in the aeronautics department here at the college, but I'm not the current head of department. That made me smile when I just saw it. Uh, but I was head of department through the appointment and uh, Kun Yang's progression through to professor. Um, so let me start by saying I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture by my colleague Kun Yang Lee. Um, and when I say welcome you all, of course I've got all of you in person here, but we've also got a very sizable group online, so I'm pleased you've all been able to join us. Um, those of you here in person, I have to talk to you about the procedures in the case of emergency. There are no fire alarm drills uh, planned, and so if it goes off, it's real, okay? So if we have, have a fire alarm, We've simply got to uh, exit the building, follow the green emergency signs. Now, in this lecture here, I just want to point out, there's an exit at the bottom here, but there's exits at the back for you guys. Go out of the building by the fastest route, and we're all going to assemble, and I hope we don't have to do this, but if it happens, we're going to assemble at the junction of Exhibition Road, which runs along the side of this building here, and Imperial College, uh, road which is behind the building and it's that, that's the road between this building and the block with the science museum and the entrance to the subway down to South Kent tube station. Um, now you may have read in the uh, short uh, biography produced for this event that Kun Yang joined the department in 2015 and he was actually promoted to professor not this year 2024 but 2022. So he's progressed to professor in a remarkably short period of time, and I think that indicates his success as an academic. He's been extremely uh, successful in his uh, progress here. Now, when he joined us in 2015, he wasn't new to the college. He actually did his undergraduate degree in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And he stayed on in that department to do his PhD and then a, a work as a research associate for a while as well. And so you might be uh, wondering why we've got a chemical engineer in the Department of Aeronautics. But actually among the staff in the aeronautics department, we've got a very broad range of expertise. So in addition to what you might expect, aeronautical engineers and engineers focused on the development of space technologies, we've also got mathematicians, we've got material scientists, we've got physicists, and we've got engineers of other types. So we've got mechanical engineers and, what, well, civil engineers, I, I was a civil engineer. And of course, as in Kun Yang's case, we've got chemical engineers as well. And that breadth of expertise simply reflects the fact that uh, we, we, we've got the broad range of needs to address in the aerospace sector. And now I've lost where I am in here. Let me just get to the right point. Yes, um, why, did Kun Yang, why was Kun Yang brought in? He was brought into our department specifically to help us grow our research in the development of improved materials. And you're obviously going to hear more about this in the inaugural lecture. But before Kun Yang starts, I'd just like to point out two things. First of all, those of you in the lecture theatre can see, but it's probably perhaps not so obvious to those of you online, but the lecture's been recorded, so just bear that in mind. Um, during the lecture, of course, questions may arise in your mind about what's been talked about, but there'll be an opportunity at the end of the lecture for you to ask questions. So please just make a note and uh, we'll give you a chance to ask those questions. And there'll be an opportunity for the people online to do exactly the same thing. So I think at this point, uh, all I need to do now is invite Kun Yang to present his inaugural lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. 
Thanks, Paul. Does it work? Yeah, it does work. All right. So, hi, my name is uh, Kun Yang for the 10% of the audience who knows me. This is Kun Yang. And the other 90%, hi, I'm Kun Yang. So, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we should go back to the cellulose future. I'll go through a little bit of, of uh, why this is actually an aeronautics topic and hopefully convince you that uh, it is somehow related to flying stuff. Okay? Uh, so before I forget, and I always do, uh, I would like to thank at least the researchers that passed through uh, my group before. Uh, those one with massive heads is, is basically a tradition that, that I took from my old professor. Essentially, when you do your PhD or you do research with me, you get a headache, massive headache, right? So heads are all massive. Uh, and yeah, most of them are here. So if you find them, uh, please thank them for me as well so that we have results to show you today. But doing research is not cheap. Uh, before I forget as well, I would also like to thank the funders uh, for funding uh, research over the last nine years now uh, to allow us to fund them and to do a lot of exciting, weird, sexy science uh, to, to get to where we are today about cellulosic research. Anyway, so what my group does, right? So we do everything from pulp and paper to cellulosic research to composites to emulsions to porous materials to waste biomass, waste plastics, uh, and uh, and well everything in between. And these are the last. These are the things that we worked on in the last four years. Before that, we worked on something else as well. Uh, today, I will focus mainly on the top right hand side corner here, so the pulp and paper, the cellulose side of things, and the bottom left hand corner the waste uh, biomass side of things. Uh, so how did I end up at Imperial College? So I'm a Malaysian, if you haven't noticed, uh, probably from my accent. I grew up in a little tiny town down there, uh, and it's beautiful. Uh, it oversees Singapore on the other side, so Johor Bahru, Malaysia is on the beautiful side there. Uh, so I spent the first 19 years of my life in Malaysia, applied to join a medical degree, to do medicine in Malaysia, was rejected because that year, out of 100, everyone applied, 128 top scorers of the equivalent A-levels was not offered a position to do med medical degree. Now, there are lots of politics behind, Google it if you want to, but uh, it's, it's, it's a governmental policy that I'm not allowed to do medical degree in Malaysia. Uh, so I ended up in chemical engineering, Imperial College on the other side. Uh, continued to do uh, my PhD there on composite materials, again, in chemical engineering. Uh, hang around for research, associate a little bit to chemistry as well in University of Vienna, and then ended up in uh, University College London, chemical engineering again, until uh, the previous, previous head of the department uh, uh, asked me to, to apply to this position. Okay, also uh, part of Paul's uh, uh, initiative to, to ask me to apply back. To do a little bit on polymers, a little bit of composites, a little bit of biomass research, and a little tiny thing called cellulose. So, uh, the title of the talk today is Back to A, the cellulose future. So, for those who don't know what cellulose is, that is cellulose. All right, it's a, it's a linear uh, macromolecule uh, consisting of that beta 1,4 glucan chain. If you're a chemist, you understand what I say. If you're not a chemist, don't worry. Just think of this. It's an important part, and it has a lot of these hydroxyl groups that will come to play in a, uh, uh, in a bit, okay? It's very, very long. Uh, usually, for a good quality cellulosic material, you would have 6,000 of these repeating itself across the chain, all right? 6,000 of them. Uh, usually, it's better to put this in a stick and ball configuration. So again, imagine you have 6,000 of these stick and ball structure, very, very long, very linear. Okay, uh, And as a cellulose molecule, it's great, but usually it will agglomerate uh, together into what we call a cellulose crystal. Now, we know it exists. We know the different crystalline phases it exists. What we don't know is, specifically, is how many molecules packed together to form that crystals. Numbers such as 16 to 36 to 168 exist. We don't know what it is, and that is an open question. How many do they pack together to form their crystals? Now, these crystals will then pack themselves, assemble themselves, agglomerate themselves together into what we call fibrils, uh, which looks like that. You can actually see them here, all of these. 
uh, individual, what you call lines, if you will, they are actually one single cellulose fibrils, about four to eight nanometers in, in width. These individual fibrils, most of the time, they will agglomerate together, forming larger fibrils of approximately 15 uh, to 100 nanometers in width as well. And these fibrils will most of the time agglomerate together uh, into larger pulp fibers. And this is what they do. They all, that hydrogen bonds, that hydroxyl groups that you've seen, will ensure that they all assemble together into these uh, different structures. Think of it as, as uh, Russian dolls. Every time you peel open, there's something inside of the same uh, structure, okay? Now, typically you see cellulose, you know of cellulose typically from trees, right? So what you do is you have trees, you remove the bark on the outside, you get uh, essentially wood. You remove some of the compound inside uh, wood, so basically you remove the lignin inside uh, wood, you get cellulose fibers. Now this is what you typically uh, uh, experience every day. They are your paper, they are your very, very beautiful, fluffy uh, pulp fibers, if you will. Okay? Uh, and all of these pulp fibers, they are actually made out of bundles of smaller fibrils, and those bundles of smaller fibrils are made of even smaller fibrils, uh, all assembled together, all the way down to uh, the, the molecular level, one cellulose molecule. So to go from this step to that step is a horribly difficult process. Uh, cellulose is abundant in nature, but it's impossible. Well, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult to actually dissolve your cellulose fibers down to a cellulose uh, molecular level without using rather harsh uh, solvating conditions. So when you think of cellulose, you think of wood that you have seen earlier. Uh, you think of paper, so basically these sort of uh, pulp fibers, you can assemble them into paper, and then you sprinkle in a little bit of aeronautics, and you get what the heck, right? So this is where the back to the cellulose future matters, the back uh, to it. So here's an iconic uh, uh, British invention, the Spitfire, uh, designed, uh, produced in 1938. Uh, for those who are younger generation who don't know, this, along with the hurricanes, helped us in the Battle of Britain back in the war a very, very long time ago, the Second World War, right? Not the first one, the second one, right? Uh, it's powered by a, a Rolls-Royce's Merlin engine, which can be found in the Roderick Hill building still uh, at the entrance there. So if you want to go check that out, please feel free to as well. Uh, little did we know, in a classified document, somewhere, which you can find now in the National Archive, published by the Royal Aircraft Establishment, uh, which then becomes the Defence Research Agency, which then becomes a Defence Evaluation Research Agency, which then got split into the government-owned Defence Science and Technology and the privately-owned Kinetic. That Royal Aircraft Establishment uh, published a document in 1945. Uh, it's unclassified, so I can present this to you guys. Uh, uh, on a thing on Gordon Aerolite plastic Spitfire fuselage. So within that document, it actually highlighted that during the early days of the war, again, the Second World War, there was a shortage of lightweight alloys. And the RAE, the Royal Aircraft Establishment, uh, tried and tested a lot of different materials to replace that lightweight alloys, and one of which was plastics based on high-strength cellulose fibers were the most promising. They did not stop that. They don't build little tiny uh, test panels. They actually built a prototype of a Spitfire out of this cellulose fiber reinforced phenolic resin. So that Gordon Aerolite essentially is flax fibers, so plant fibers impregnated with phenolic resin. They molded it, they built a Spitfire out of it. Luckily, the war ended. So it did not need to go to production. Luckily, thank God for that. Uh, but if that doesn't convince you, let's move a little bit uh, into the future uh, in the country that no longer exists, East Germany. You have that refurbished uh, Traban. So uh, some of you might have uh, owned this car before or at least seen it on the street. Uh, production year, 1957. It's probably the first or at least one of the first ever recycled materials. Oh, I know, I know. Uh, Elena actually was from East Germany as well. So probably her father might have actually had this car. Uh, so it's made of recycled materials whereby the, the most of the hood is actually made out of cotton waste 
reinforce a phonolic resin. So cellulose in aerospace, the concept was there. Cellulose in automotive uh, as a sustainable material is, was actually there back in the days, right? It was from then, plastic boomed, uh, polymer science boomed, that we've sort of forgotten all of these uh, old invention back in the days. So now we're going to talk about the future, which is the main uh, topic today. So we shown, I've shown you this slide earlier. Uh, you have wood, uh, you remove lignin, you get, uh, end up with this uh, cellulose fibers down here, uh, which you actually use to make uh, paper. Uh, you find ways to dissolve it into a molecular structure. You spin textile clothing, so you wear them. So cellulose is great on that. Uh, at this level, you can actually make your Gordon aerolite, that sort of composite structures that you use in, in that uh, presented to you earlier. But uh, wood itself is, mechanically speaking, 5 gigapascal in, in, in compression modulus, 70 megapascal in strength. So that's just about uh, slightly better than, than some of the polymers that you actually experience every day. But if you're able to go all the way down to this scale down here, yeah, this cellulose nanofibril scale down there, suddenly your performance of that nanofiber goes up uh, to 100 gigapascal. So that is uh, 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 beyond the performance of glass fibers. The strength here will easily go up to 1500 megapascal. And, and again, that is a lower bound. The, the, hard, the, the upper bound is about 6,000 megapascal. Again, that easily beats glass fiber. Remember, these things here, the density is, is, is half of that of glass fibers. So that cellulose at the nanoscale uh, is most likely at least a future that we're trying to strive towards to actually exploit these high performance in uh, materials. So at this stage, you may ask, how are we going to extract these materials, right? So wood, we know, we can pulp it, we get these fibers uh, at this scale, micron scale, we know how to do that. Uh, we can easily get that cellulose molecules out, uh, we know how to do that. To get to this uh, intermediate uh, scale, if you will, uh, you just take pulp, which you delignify, uh, these sort of uh, white cellulose fibers, you put it through high-pressure homogenizers, you put it through grinders, you put it through fluidizers. What it actually does is that the, the micrometer-sized fibers in these high-pressure systems, you shear them apart, exposing the smaller fibrils. The smaller fibrils gets sheared apart again, exposing even more smaller fibrils, all the way down to the smallest possible building block, the cellulose nanofibrils there. So for those plant-derived uh, cellulose, uh, uh, we typically call them the nanofibrillated cellulose. Yeah? So that's a picture of that, approximately sort of uh, 10 to 50 nanometers in width, uh, as long as it can be several micrometers in length. Length is a quite a difficult thing to, to, to quantify. So this is how it looks like uh, at the starting pulp, so quite dry, fibrous. Uh, once you put it through the homogenization process, you get a creamy-like uh, material that it has this uh, nanofibrous texture uh, underneath, okay? Now, so we don't have to always start from uh, wood. Uh, in 1886, 1886, 1886, a, a scientist actually found that certain bacterial species actually produce this material for us. Uh, so, so bacterial uh, from the Comaga acetobacter family, uh, you feed them sugar, the bacteria is extremely happy all of a sudden and it started to produce something for us. And that something looks like that. And I have those here. It's that sheet there. Uh, we didn't grow this in the lab. You can actually grow this commercially. You can buy them commercially as well. Uh, and uh, that thing, if you take a close look, is actually a uniformly distributed, uh, uh, at least from a di uh, width perspective. Uh, 50 nanometer diameter, uh, 50 nanometer in width, uh, fibrils. Uh, and, and we call these fibrils uh, bacterial cellulose for today's uh, presentation here, okay? Now, so knowing that these two types of nanocelluloses, yeah, so you have one from plant, the nanofibrillated cellulose, you have one from bacterial origin, which we call bacterial cellulose, which is this uh, jelly thing there. Uh, what can we do with them? So this is how research works, right? 
uh, some uh, uh, funder, some, some agency uh, or some uh, curious uh, person that has funding comes to you. We hear that nanocellulose, so these things, uh, is a strong material and you, as a scientist, yes, it is a material of the future. Uh, then they throw you a curveball. Can you use it to make better transparent materials for impact protection? So me was like, really? Nanocellulose, the thing that you grow, the thing that you have in plants, you want me to put them into that uh, for better protection? And this is where Impure is really uh, great, right? Working in Impure is really great because you get all of these uh, weird uh, questions being thrown at you. So that's supposed to be a thumbs up, but I don't know why it came there. But essentially, I did say to the funder, yes, we can do it. So if you actually think a little bit about it, so this bacterial cellulose uh, particle itself, is actually quite a tough uh, continuous nanofibrous network. Uh, when you dry them out, it actually has a rather high surface area. So that 50 square meter per gram is actually our lower bound. So when you were to impregnate whole networks with a resin, as the fiber deforms, you have a lot of surface area that, that the crack has to go around that technically speaking increases uh, uh, energy absorption uh, mechanisms such as fiber debonding and so on and so forth. So that technically speaking should work. And ultimately the single fiber themselves have to break and they are quite strong and quite stiff as well. So, so that actually helps and the diameter is small. And why is that good? It's so small that it actually doesn't interact with light, meaning that it will be transparent if you were to immerse them within or impregnate them within the right a, a polymer system. Uh, and lastly, it's the refractive index, right? The refractive index of these organic materials fairly similar to the refractive index of uh, some commercial polymers that actually is used currently to, uh, for impact protection. So with that starting point, uh, we, we decided to crack on. So me being a chemical engineer, uh, the first thing that you think of is, is it commercially available? Is it manufacturable? And the answer is yes. It looks like it's a laboratory uh, experiment, but this thing is available commercially. You can buy them in Earl's Court. Uh, uh, in the form of nata di coco. So actually it's a Southeast Asian dessert. I love it. Uh, so that's how it looks like down here. Uh, and if you're in the uh, west coast of the United States, you most likely will encounter a lot of, uh, let's say, younger generations growing this thing uh, at home. So this is basically your, your kombucha tea. You can actually find this in the UK now in Marks and Spencer, rather expensive. Uh, but you can actually grow this at home. They drink the liquid, but this cellulose floating on top, they throw it away. So yes, you can you can uh, you can dry, you can buy them, you can uh, make them, and uh, it's expensive. It's hundred dollars per kilogram dry, so so it's actually uh, not cheap. So again, your chemical engineering hat on. Uh, use less of this, and it should technically speaking uh, work. Right. So Elba uh, started this work with us uh, after numerous trials. The idea here is that we come up with. A laminated construct. So you would have your polymer, you would have your bacterial cellulose sheet dried, uh, and then another polymer again, you stack them together, you fuse them together, uh, it should technically work. So you architecturally speaking, that's how it looks like at the bottom. Polymer, cellulose, polymer. Yeah. Uh, and it's predictable, so, so our funder likes it. Uh, with that sort of architecture, and you can stack them up quite easily as well. So you can have, you can build easily 5, 10, 20 uh, millimeter thick structure if you really, really want to. So we started off with the dried version of that bacterial cellulose, which basically is this thing right here. Well, you can dry that, it becomes this little tiny piece of paper. You put them in a polymer, uh, in a polymer it actually comes up transparent. Uh, for the reasons that I told you earlier. So that uh, small uh, uh, fibril diameter and uh, the matching refractive index, and it actually works. Uh, but what Elba did actually find out was that if you do it wrong, it will not work. So this picture on the left here actually showed that if you have this, uh, this uh, wet pellicle, wet cellulose, when you press them directly into a dried sheet, when it immersed in a polymer resin, it's transparent. It's great for us. If you were to start with this, 
you put it in the blender, you blend it up, like how you would make paper uh, in kindergarten or in primary school, you blend it up, you remove the water, you dry them into a piece of paper as well, something like this. Infiltrate in a resin system, it's no longer transparent. So the key here is that we must preserve the original structure of, of these uh, 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 bacterial cellulose uh, um, structure in there. So yes, we know what makes it transparent. Uh, one problem is that this thing is, is rather brittle, so it doesn't actually work as well. Uh, so Natalia came to the group the, uh, a couple of years back and decided that, you know what, I'm going to uh, take this pellicle I am going to swap out the water with a high solvent, uh, a high boiling point uh, molecule, polyethylene glycol. Uh, so these are polyethylene glycol uh, of 200 molecular weights, 400 or 600 uh, molecular weights. So essentially, you soak them in polyethylene glycol, you dry off the water, the polyethylene glycol stays behind, infiltrated, you squeeze the excess out, and you get again a similar uh, uh, structure. And now in this case, instead of dried, Air, you actually have 50% polyethylene glycol in the system. And we actually see the whole thing becomes more ductile there. So without that polyethylene glycol coating, it goes up, brilliant, it breaks. With polyethylene glycol, it goes up, it keeps going through plastic deformation, rather ductile, and uh, it breaks afterwards. So you're actually getting that improvement in, in that significant, uh, what we call strain at failure. How long, how much can you stretch before it actually fractures? The reason why it works uh, it is because without that coating, this is one of the fracture surfaces. So you pull it apart, it fractures. You take a look at it, what happens during fracture. Uh, you can't see much. You just all you see is clean fracture. With that polyethylene glycol, you suddenly to see the fibers. Uh, we get sort of fibrillation process where you actually start to see the fibers uh, coming up. And the reason is because without with that polyethylene glycol coating, now upon pulling, upon deformation you are able to rotate the fiber, so that gives that plasticity until it sort of slides and slips out from each other, uh, giving rise to that, uh, that ductile behavior that you see earlier. So Natalia carried on and decided to create a composite construct that, that we talked about earlier. So what she basically did was having uh, the multiple polymer layers stacked together, fuse them together to create that laminated construct. And we did actually see a beautiful increase in the impact performance here. So this is your unreinforced sample, so pure polymer, uh, no reinforcement inside there. You can double it quite easily with the right type of, uh, of polyethylene glycol that you are using. So that's great, but there's only one problem there. It's no longer transparent all of a sudden. So that sort of push us back to where we start. Uh, because again, the polyethylene glycol system wasn't the right refractive index with the, the cellulose, so it doesn't, it's not transparent anymore. So this is where Daniela, sitting right at the front here, uh, comes into play. So she, she decided that uh, she would take that piece of uh, bacterial cellulose pellicle, dewater them, and then impregnate that with the polyacrylated urethane resin, uh, and there is a piece of sample there. It is transparent. If you can't, it's there. Trust me, it's there. It is transparent, so that's great. So we actually get a transparent, thin uh, a polymer composite that's from starting from this. It turns to a transparent structure. That's great. So it's, we were happy with that. We laminate them up uh, with multiple layers of this. So you have a one layer system all the way to five layers. And yes, there is a three millimeter thick structure standing right in front of seashell. It's probably so transparent that probably you can't see them, but it's there. Uh, so the transparency of that thing is still retained. Good for us. Uh, again, now putting back on your chemical engineering hat, or my chemical engineering hat, uh, manufacturability. So the raw materials we're trying out here, impact modifier acrylic, uh, commercially available. Bacterial cellulose, commercially available. You can grow them. Uh, every single processing step here is nothing more than just remove water, heat press them. So from a cost perspective, from a simplicity of the manufacturing perspective, it's all there, rather simple and rather straightforward. So uh, we then tested this thing in terms of performance. Uh, so these are the structures, the samples again, are sitting right in front of you. They are still transparent, uh, as you can see from this graph up here, rather transparent, and the performance, impact performance actually goes up as well. So that's all great, having that uh, after seven years of trying this thing, seven years, 
we finally got there. You start off with this uh, wet gel that you have here. You dry them out into a piece of uh, uh, paper, impregnate them with a, the right uh, polymer resin, stack them up, it's transparent, and it does have improved uh, impact performance. So seven years, we got there finally at the end. So yes. So then a funder come to us and ask us again, similar story. So they heard that nanocellulose is a wonder material and me being me, yes, it is the future. Uh, can you help us to improve the performance of our permeable chemical and biological protective suit? Me was wondering what? I thought it was this one. Uh, great, I would like to work on that because that looks uh, like it's gonna help the country a lot. Uh, again, there should be a thumbs up down there. I'm not sure why it disappears off. Anyway, in reality though, this wasn't what I was asked to work on. I was asked to work on that thing there. So that actually is a, a suit that, that our soldiers actually uh, use uh, and it will stop uh, 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 liquid and chemical uh, hazardous uh, vapor coming through. Uh, but what they wanted us to solve is to stop aerosolized particles, essentially sand, sand particles uh, coming through while you allow moisture for the, from, the, from the person wearing it to pass through out back so that it doesn't feel the, the strain due to, to, to that uh, wearing that thing for, for, uh, for too long. So Joanne decided to tackle this problem. Uh, here's the, the internal structure of that material. So you have an open porous fabric at the front with an activated carbon layer at the back. If you have too much sand particles going through, it damages the activated carbon layer at the back that's not good news for the person wearing it. So how can we help with making this sure that this thing is no longer permeable to solids, right? So we started with a bacterial cellulose or wood-derived non-fibrillated cellulose. You filter this thing, you coat this thing onto the fabric themselves. So what we actually did achieve was uh, the different grammages, essentially how much mass per unit area. So we go up to one GSM, your writing paper is 70, 80 GSM. Your Imperial College tissue paper, it's 15 GSM. So we're coating 15 times less of this thing, material on a piece of open woven fabric. So here's how it looks like without the coating. And here's how it looks like with that coating, with just one grams per square meter of this material, uh, with that sort of bacterial cellulose, this thing coating on top. Uh, and the ones with the plant-derived version, it's there, you just don't see them. Uh, how did it perform? Well, it actually worked for, so here's the uncoated sample. Uh, it doesn't, it only stopped 19% of the particles of less than 2.5 microns, true. Uh, I only stop 90%, sorry. Uh, for those coated samples, you can easily hit 90%, 90, nearly 95% of filtration efficiency uh, for particles less than 2.5 microns with just one grams for every square meter uh, of, of your fabric being coated with that. Uh, what really makes us excited was that the water vapor permeability, again, uncoated sample with those coated samples, they stayed the same. Again, it, because the coating is so thin, and secondly, cellulose being cellulose, are hydroxyl groups that you have seen earlier, they are rather hydroscopic, they are hydro, uh, so water will permeate through whatever uh, layers that you put on, whatever cellulose layer that you put on, uh, quite happily. Uh, the coating is actually quite robust as well, so we take the, our coated samples, we twist them, like how we would use uh, in real life. Uh, the coating is still there, it just there's a crease that you see. We cut them with a knife, uh, again, you see the cut, and the coating is still there as well. We wet them in water, we dry them out, thinking that that coating will fall off. Uh, it did not. It reduces the filtration efficiency by up to two, three percentage points, but that's it. The coating still stays there. Again, that's what you can achieve with, with hydrogen, uh, with cellulose, because you, have, you will form the hydrogen bonds, uh, so it stays there quite stably. Uh, so just Part one of the conclusion, so cellulose, which I demonstrated to you, was the future before, and nanocellulose is the future now. Uh, you can make transparent materials, you can make uh, coatings, uh, all you needed to do to make sure that it goes out to the market, essentially, is your process has to be simple, manufacturable, and achieve a performance that conventional materials cannot achieve. 
Now, not everything is nano, right? Uh, cellulose itself is actually a very brilliant molecule, uh, but you don't really need to go to that nano scale. So within my group, we work a lot on waste materials, uh, plastic waste, chicken feathers, textile waste, you name it. Uh, we worked it before. We even have municipal solid waste from your recycling bins in, in uh, uh, multiple councils from Wales uh, sitting in the lab. They smell amazing, by the way, in the lab. Whenever we open it, students loved it. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, palm oil waste. So I'm a Malaysian, if you haven't noticed. Uh, palm oil is in my blood. I love it. Uh, so what is palm oil? So you take your, your, your fruit bunch down, you take out uh, the fruit itself, you squeeze out as much oil as you can from, uh, from that palm oil to produce waste. So this, you use to refine and make all the, the higher value products out of it. After you strip your bunch of that fresh fruit, you end up with what we call the empty fruit bunch, uh, sitting right up there. Typically, you leave them on the field and let it rot. Or in worst case scenario, you burn. And when you burn them, it's not great for my country. This thing usually happens in Indonesia. It blows towards Malaysia. So not good. So what we wanted to do was to help smaller farmers to actually upgrade these things, materials, uh, these materials up so that they would burn less and would create something of higher value. So what we did essentially was we take these uh, empty fruit bunch, we combine them with your pulp fibers, blend everything together, squeeze out the water, and what you get is a rather stiff uh, fiber board. And this one has 30% pulp fibers and the rest are just your waste empty fruit bunch. Uh, rather stiff, rather strong. Uh, without it, it's basically quite bendy, right? So without that, that pulp fibers to bind everything together, it's quite uh, uh, bendy. So, so you do need to have that uh, cellulosic structures in there to bind everything together. This thing, you can steam it, like how you would uh, uh, just put in a steamer essentially, reshape it, and you can ship it into, well, little tiny Nespresso capsules if you really want to and you dry it, it retains its shape. So from this to that is simple steaming, uh, just how, like how you would make hockey sticks in Canada. Uh, so what Daru did essentially was to measure the performance of these uh, fiber bots down here. Uh, they are comparable to your conventional MDF, whatever they are writing on at the moment. They are made out of MDF, so it is comparable to that. Uh, in terms of bending modulus, bending strength, uh, it is actually better than particle bots, uh, so that's good news. So this one has at least uh, improved performance. Uh, we then measure the, uh, the, 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 the moldability of these materials, whether you start wet, you mold it, and then you let it dry, versus when you start dry, you steam it, you mold it, and you let it dry again to look at the curvature that you can achieve. Is it going to be any different? Apart from a bit, a slight difference in terms of the force that you need to bend and mold the materials, at the end of the day, you will achieve the same level of curvature that you want. So all you need, why do we care, right? All you need to do is now you make this material, you transport it around the world, the manufacturer can then steam this thing up, reshape it into the shape they are interested in, dry it up, they have their products. So we don't have to transport waste materials, which has no value. We don't have to transport pulp materials, which is very expensive, uh, and, and more like put everything together, which requires uh, uh, equipment. So we don't have to do that. We give them a solution, a, one, uh, a rather simple solution to solve that uh, problem. What else uh, can cellulose do for us, right? So uh, back in 2015, when I first started, uh, we were asked the question, uh, can you replace rigid packaging? Uh, so we said, of course we can. So how do we do it? We basically make your pulp fibers hairy. What do we mean by making it hairy? Essentially, here's your single uh, pulp fiber. You put it through a grinder. So like I said earlier, right? So every single grinding process shears the, the, the surface fibers apart. Uh, and the longer you grind, the smaller it becomes. If you do it just right, you can retain that original starting fibers and only the surface of the, the, the fibers gets uh, fibrillated. So that's what we call hairy pulp fibers. When you pack these hairy pulp fibers together, something magical happens. So a lot of information to digest, but let's look at the bottom left-hand side corner here. The more you refine, 
the lower the porosity of this material because that uh, free-flowing fibers, the hairiness of the fibers, start to pack in between the, the gaps formed by the larger fibers, reducing porosity, so that's great. Uh, once your porosity gets reduced, uh, your air resistance of these blue uh, squares suddenly jumps up, and this is actually a lower bound, by the way. Uh, our instrument couldn't go any larger than 38,000 uh, seconds. So this blue curve, the higher the value, the better. So that pore blocking effect actually helps increase air resistance. And one thing that really surprised us was OTR, oxygen transmission rates. So that oxygen transmission rate, the star, actually drops significantly with that refining process. Uh, and because of that pore filling effect, uh, you also have a lot of, of pores being filled up, so you have a lot of cellulosic fibers holding each other together, forming a rather rigid uh, material, and you can actually see that the mechanical performance goes up with refining time as well. Uh, and lastly, we can also mold them into different structures. So like basically molded pulp products, just that with better uh, uh, oxygen, uh, uh, with lower oxygen transmission rates, uh, better resistance. Now, it all sounds good on paper, but in reality though, this thing, uh, it's still not quite resistant to water. Again, remember, cellulose, cellulosic molecules, cellulose themselves, is actually uh, hygroscopic. So water loves it. Uh, so we, 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 we haven't actually had a very good way to stop water from passing through, but it's already a good start uh, uh, on reducing the, the oxygen uh, uh, transmission through uh, these uh, structures. So, uh, my last concluding remarks here. So, again, cellulose was the future. You have seen it before. In fact, you can actually trace cellulose-based products all the way uh, to the Great Exhibition uh, Festival back in the 1800s. There was cellulose nitrate being exhibited there as well, uh, where Exhibition Road is, is now sort of named after. And with increasing awareness towards sustainability, now cellulose is coming up as the future. And that's actually rightly so, because you can grow easily uh, woody biomass. You strip out the lignin that you don't want. Uh, you convert this lignin to high-value chemicals. You convert this lignin to electricity to, 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 uh, to, to generate power. That's great. What you end up with is just this pulp. Right? Uh, you can then make more into different cellulose-based uh, uh, product, and at the end of life, you can recycle them. Remember, cellulose paper is one of the most recycled materials in the world, right? Uh, and you keep every carbon that you capture up there in this particular loop until you are done with it. You send it through your, your, your uh, degradation process, composting or whatnot. It produces CO2, you grow more trees, and you have this cycle all over again. So effectively keeping that carbon in that loop with uh, using materials as a carbon sink with this uh, cellulosic uh, structures. Now, again, the same names, a little bit more. Uh, I could have made it today here uh, without uh, all of these students uh, here uh, uh, named. So too many to, to, to name, I just decided to put dump all the names inside there. Uh, a lot of external collaborators, without them, I can't actually make it work. And, and doing research is really, really not cheap in London. So I would definitely love to thank all of these uh, people here. Uh, in terms of the three uh, people that I would rather thank specifically, these are the three students, uh, Martin, Wenzi, and Jana. So Jana was the one who did the cellulose work uh, uh, when I first started. They joined me at UCL Chemical Engineering in 2013. They moved with me to Imperial College in 2015, where we started with two little tiny writing desks. Two little tiny writing desks in a lab hidden in one of the building's basements somewhere. Two writing desks. Uh, they moved, those three moved with me to a slightly larger uh, makeshift laboratory in uh, the, in the old chemical engineering aeronautics building. And they moved with me here to City and Guilds building. So a lot of moves, these three students uh, that actually helped me. Without them, I could have made it uh, here today. And also special thanks to, to all my internal colleagues who actually help with a lot of useful discussions. Again, too many to name. Uh, and I always feel that some of the, our uh, uh, professional staff is always under, under, not underrepresented, under acknowledged. 
without our departmental operations manager, so Molly, Liz, Shan, uh, and Steph Pendlebury from IMSI, uh, they are the driving force to make sure that all our contracts get through, all our costing gets done, and I'm always late with costings, and if you tell Imperial College that, I'm sorry, I have a costing I need to do that's due in five days, they will say, no, we're not going to do it for you, but you tell our operations manager, they will make sure that they get the costing out for you. So I do actually thank them a lot. HR, uh, again, they are the ones that make sure that all my students are legal in the UK and post as well, uh, and spending money and saving money, uh, doing lots of costings for us and all the technical stuff, including uh, one from chemical engineering as well. Uh, definitely uh, Institute of Molecular Science and Engineering, uh, the global institutes of Imperial College, one of those. They actually help build this multidisciplinary team that supports uh, what I actually need to do. All the industrial contacts, I go through uh, via them and they push things through so much faster uh, than what the college can do for us. Uh, and last three things I need to say. So my ex-ex head of department, he was the one who uh, hired me back in 2015. So I remember one of my uh, very first uh, meeting before I signed the contract. Uh, Kun Yang, so uh, what else do you want to know about Imperial College and Arrow? No, no, great, I want to join you guys. Are you sure? Yes. Do you not want to know the salary that we're going to give you? No. Why? I know you're just going to pay more than the previous university. Anyway, your minimum, your lowest minimum is higher than the maximum of another universities. Uh, so thank you, Ferry, for hiring me. Uh, and, and doing your performance review with him is always great because it's always spot on, telling you what you actually need to, to get on with your career. Uh, obviously, Paul, I served under Paul for uh, the longest, I think five, four, five years or so. Uh, without him, I wouldn't get to professor, and without him, I wouldn't have orders that the research facilities I need to have to get my research done here over at, at uh, City and Guilds uh, building here. And without him, I wouldn't be doing a lot of administration as well uh, that he asked me to do. And Spencer, I only had Spencer for one year and a little bit. Uh, so again, thank you for letting me drop all the administrations. Uh, again, without you, I would still be doing, doing a lot of admin work, but now I don't have to do any of them. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, thank everyone here for listening to me babbling about cellulose. I know you guys have much better things to do on a Wednesday evening than listening to me talking about boring stuff. So I do thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kun Yang, for an excellent inaugural lecture. But you don't escape just yet, of course, no. because there's going to be some questions. And what we'll try and do is, uh, providing there's enough questions, we'll try and alternate between in-person questions from people here and online. OK, so, and we've got people with microphones ready to run around and hand you a microphone. So do we have a first question, please? OK, shall we go down to the front here? And are you receiving? Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, you mentioned that uh, the cellulose can be made by bacteria. Are they also vulnerable to bacteria and fungi? If you have enough sugar inside, they will start to grow things within, uh, within this uh, structure. Uh, uh, but they are crystalline enough that uh, the condition is, is a little bit more difficult to slowly eat them and degrade them away. But it will be eaten away if the, if the condition is right. Okay, we have samples that are growing weird stuff in the lab, by the way. Uh, sorry, uh, Shall we take a question from online? Because I think we've got one. Yes. Uh, the online question would be, if you think that cellulose will eventually replace all plastics in everyday use and maybe even used in bionic uh, replace all plastics one day, uh, we want an honest answer, probably not. Uh, but it will replace sufficient uh, stuff eventually in our everyday life to make sure that in the future we will be as sustainable as we can be. I think that's okay. yeah. uh, I had a question related to that, which was my question, which was, um, you mentioned, so you, you gave some use cases. What, what use cases can you see in this kind of on the horizon in the foreseeable future? Not to that question, you know, ultimately all plastics, but what can you see in the upcoming future? So, uh, 
most likely packaging, whether it's rigid or, or, or flexible. So you're starting to see a lot of shift towards that direction already. Uh, that's a lower hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, then you have the more difficult to achieve, the more advanced materials that are much more demanding. So uh, the, the cultures are sitting on, can we make them out of porous cellular structure? That is a lot more difficult. So these are already wood, so that's great. So all you need to do is replace that 10% phenol formaldehyde, you'll be fine. But your seed that you're sitting on is polyurethane, 100% petroleum based. Can we convert those to cellulose? We may not be able to fully replace them, but if you replace 50%, that gives us more time to find better solutions uh, further down the line. Do we have another one yep. online? Go yes. On. Um, another online question would be if there's advantages and disadvantages of using cellulose compared to fungal-based biomaterials? Uh, in, so they are equally good and equally bad at the same time. So uh, there's actually uh, the, the, the main difference here being how they bond together. So in terms of cellulose, when they bond together, beautifully, they bond via hydrogen bonds. But for fungal type systems, they do have that. But they also have the, the, the other beta glucan system that actually bonds a little bit differently. So you have that, uh, that structure as well there. So it may affect the final product. But, but overall, uh, they both are great replacement for sustainability for the future. Thank you. I had a question about uh, the circularity that you showed on recyclability. I was wondering if that recyclability was compromised when you got those laminates uh, with polymers. How much is that recyclability compromised from cellulose from when you got the composite with uh, so, polymers? So, uh, so the, the specific case that, that I presented, they're probably not designed for recycl recyclable structures, but we also have those laminated constructs that, that, that are designed to be recycled. The beauty is that these are papers, right? So when you put them to the recycling uh, uh, facility, they get shredded away, so the polymers will get filtered out, uh, and then get pure cellulose on the other side. So okay. that's what you recycle. And this one, it may be degraded, it may be burned, I don't know. It does depend on what you put in there. All right, thank you. Have we got anything else online? Okay. Any other questions in the room? Right at the back, can we do that? Sorry, we're focused on the front here. Who's going to be the next person speaking, right? It's going to move. Now I'm, now I'm here to ask a question, Kun Yang. Is it actually desirable to replace durable materials with degradable materials? No. Or in, in essence, replace all polymers by cellulose? No, no, no. no we, are not going to re we are never going to go to a point where we can replace all polymers. There are certain uh, uh, materials that we could replace and certain lifestyle changes that we can make such that the final product that we can tolerate if it's actually a biodegradable product or a completely durable product. Uh, that, if we get to that stage, that will at least buy us enough time to develop much better solutions in the next 100 years to allow us to be even more sustainable. But not going to replace everything with polymers, that's for sure. But if we look at the carbon footprint, what would be actually, or oh, LCA, what would be actually better using proper polymers or cellulose-based materials. So from our own LCA studies, using cellulose materials, if you do it uh, right without the harsh chemicals that you need to apply uh, to the treatment, actually it's much better uh, from our own LCA studies. Now, uh, uh, this whole LCA of cellulose uh, is actually still open to debate as to how you actually model cellulose appropriately, but from at least what we see as the best way to model cellulose in LCA, they are actually more, uh, more sustainable compared to at least a PET or PP counterparts. Hi, uh, Kun Yang. Thanks very much. Uh, just picking up on that point, uh, obviously if you're using waste products, then that's very good from a uh, you know, life cycle point of view. But if you're talking about the growth of the bacterial cellulose, mm -hmm. uh, how does that compare if you need sugar, you need heat, you need fermenters, you need water? In those cases, uh, it would not be great for true sustainable materials. So these bacterial cellulose, uh, they are designed for you to uh, make more advanced, non-recyclable type materials, uh, which we still need in our everyday life use. But the three base cellulose, the recycled paper type system, that's actually what we want for sustainability. Thank you. Anything else in line? Anybody else in the room then? Okay. We go down here. The microphone is coming.
Ja, uh, hello, thank you for that uh, lecture. I'm a chemist and I worked for a chemical engineering contractor for years, but um, the whole subject of people against fossil fuels has got sort of two things that people don't realise. When you're in the chemical industry, you've got your feedstock, which is your organics, if you like, which gets made into the product. Yep. But we can't go away from the oil refineries, the people that are making the actual reactants that go into all the products we need. Probably two-thirds, may even be more, of the energy is consuming the original fuel. And we get, we get those because of the industry producing fuels, basically. So you've still got to uh, look at where you're getting your basic raw material that's going to become your product, the carbon that becomes your product. And people talk about carbon and fossil fuels and whatever, but you've still got all the materials that you need all around you, and part of the fossil fuel goes into the final product. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to get away from that. What you need to do is replace the way you're getting the energy. Yep. So that's one way of, that's definitely one solution to actually reduce the essentially the energy uh, footprint that you need to make the product. But there's also a separate argument where you actually try and reduce the carbon footprint of the, of the final product as well. So you decarbonize the product, not just decarbonizing the energy that yeah. you're using. So you need to decarbonize both. Uh, obviously, decarbonizing energy is a lot easier to achieve. Decarbonizing product, more difficult to achieve. Well, there's, there's more sunlight uh, lands on the earth than we need, and all of that, of course, we don't use because it lands on the oceans, but... Uh, well, not yeah. in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> but great question, thank you. Nothing else online. Okay, okay we'll take one more online. Yeah, so one more online question would be if lignin would be added to cellulose in the future to enhance properties of cellulose materials. Uh, depends how you add a lignin in. If you add it correctly, it will probably, you might actually remake wood again. So that, that's actually what we're exploring in the moment. Can we remake wood as a scientific curiosity? Okay. I think at this point, uh, we'll close the questions. Thank you very much to everybody who's asked the question. I'd like, now like to invite my friend and colleague, Professor Alexander Bismarck from the University of Vienna to give the vote of thanks. So. <laughs> That's a big one. I'm Alexander Bismarck from Imperial, uh, Imperial College. I used to be chemical <laughs> engineering. Now, now I'm from the University of Vienna. Um, that's in the heart of Europe. I made it here despite of all the odds. The plane door didn't open and the landing bridge didn't land. The Piccadilly line was late, but I listened to half of his talk. <laughs> So, now I also know what I have to do giving votes of thanks. First of all, to thank you all for being here. I should thank Paul for taking us through the late afternoon, Kun Yang for his speech, and to thank those people he forgot. Um, but it's about Kun Yang, and we heard his talk. That was young Kun Yang back then, <laughs> when he joined our group over in the chemical engineering building. Actually, is there anyone in the room who knows him longer than me? He was my undergrad student. He did his link project with Shell back then, so he knows about oil refining and, and so on, on catalyst design for, I think it was cracking, was it? Fischer Tropsch. Fischer Tropsch, okay. Building up long oils from carbon monoxide. And uh, what was it? Forgot. Anyhow, then he wanted to go to Princeton to do his PhD. But luckily, I could convince him that, that cellulose is actually a cool material. And the ORS, Overseas Research Scheme, or so on, whatever the name is, funded the missing part of the fees. So we should thank them. Otherwise, he would have been in Princeton. Now. He builds paper aeroplanes. <laughs> uh, that's where he started. That's our, used to be our lab in Kemensch 519. 
Um, see this little microwave there in the back here? That's what Kunyang used to make foams back then. And we had fun with cellulose, renewable polymers, and or real polymers. So it looks more like a chemistry lab. So that's where Kunyang started off. His first paper actually in composites, uh, science and technology. And what we did look at is, do we need cellulose to be hydrophobic to bind it to proper polymers like PLA, which is actually a stupid polymer because it degrades. Uh, what do you find out? No, you don't. Not necessarily. That's the last paper of his PhD uh, review article. And that was actually quite fun to write because we saw more than the eye could see uh, with bioengineers together. And there are two of them. Kunyang and myself, it was quite funny to do that. Ended up on the cover, and well, who made that cover, Kunyang? Well, it was, hang on, this guy here, Johnny. Also on his first paper. Kunyang happy, closer to, <laughs> closer to getting his PhD. And at the conference in the US of A called the Biomental Polymer Society, which gave him also an award in Vienna back then. At the conference, best student presentation or whatever it was. So he got actually some real money from them. Anna was also working in this project and Ling, just a friend from Singapore and also in our group. But as Kun Yang said, nothing is ever new. So we go back to the uh, old days and get inspiration from guys that did excellent science and Cox model you may know is a fiber network model but they actually developed phenolic resin reinforced poly uh, cellulose networks which we then kept on using in the Trabanca. Kunyang also forgot to thank people like Christina Oxman. All external collaborators. Uh, yeah but she was also his opponent or examiner during the PhD viva, a guy who really he managed to upset. Um, the Finnish collaborators, I sent him to Finland over summer and he spent there three weeks working in a lab and it was in August and or no, Ju July. Finland was closed, nobody was there and he was just annoyed, bloody hell. They closed the lab at seven, and thought, what do I do? It's all bright, all day. <laughs> I cannot work anymore. He's also the only PhD student I had to send on holidays in the first year, because he didn't want to take any. Anyhow, we have to thank Ama Mohanty for some inspiration, and there's a term coined by Kunyang, it's called doing the Mohanty, and you can ask him what it means, but means also being productive, and that's where we had fun, and I lost the mirror of a car. Um, Marta, sitting here, the first, our joint PhD student, finished in Vienna. There is City, showing us her back. It's a trip to the ICCM in Copenhagen. That was quite fun, and we all stayed in, in a flat. And there are guys, Milo, you know, sitting there. Tone Pace, having fun. Also some inspiration. And Lars Berglund, the guy Kunyang managed to upset because he talked about LCA not being so favorable for grinding down cellulose and trees further to the nano size, build it up from the nano character. But this discussion continues. And OK, uh, Lars is also actually now retired. So I guess he cannot be angry anymore. Uh, our first symposium that we organized together uh, at the ACS, and look at these three guys. Except for the hair, we all look alike. Aero, <laughs> Aero Conturi. And what do we like is have some fun as well. Kunyang in Texas somewhere, Johnny as well. Kunyang can also, oops, where has it gone? No, that's gone. Well, that was in the football stadium with me, and now the animation doesn't, doesn't work. We visited a rapid game, which was 
boring as hell and ended zero, zero. <laughs> so I don't, that's it. OK, but I was supposed to talk only five minutes, so just in between. Uh, Andrea is also a collaborator external of Kuhn Young, and we worked together at Imperial. They made all the membrane stuff. Johnny Blaker again, and Wim Thielmans, who is now the chair of the ACS Cellulose Division, in which Kuhn Young also works, and he got the King Fa Award for his work he has done so far pushing cellulose further. And I would like to thank you again for bearing with me, with Kuhn Young, with Paul, all afternoon. And now it's time, I hope, to get a beer, because I need one. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I would like to thank you, everybody here in person, and obviously the people online as well for joining us. The in-person audience, you do have an opportunity now to join us for the reception outside. Thank you very much, everybody. Don't run away.